All right. So we're going to we're going to give it a couple minutes cuz uh, apparently if you set up a stream on your phone in the phone app then uh you have to also launch the stream from the phone app. So I had to do a different uh had to do a different setup here for you guys. So sorry if you guys were waiting on the other channel and then came back over to this channel. I'm or to, to the other th stream and came back over to this stream rather. So I'm uh going to delete the other one real quick before we uh before we get rocking and rolling here. There we go. All right. So how is everyone Sunday morning? Um, like I said, haven't done this on a Sunday in quite some time. It was uh, much better. It was much easier to do it on Sunday this week than it was to do it last night. Like we usually do. Ken is in the chat. What is up, Ken? Hi from Pittsburgh. How are you doing, man? And yeah, like I said, as you guys come in as usual, um, you know, say hello in the chat. Uh, you guys can give me your wristwatch checks in the chat as well. Um, I can start with mine real quick. Uh, I'm wearing one of the two uh, ECA Calypso sports that I have in for review right now. Right now I'm wearing Ricardo's. Um, I have mine actually right next to me still as well. I keep alternating back and forth uh, between the two of these, which is kind of cool. It's very, uh, even when I have a watch in for review, um, it's very difficult for me to just wear the same watch every single day without fail. Um, and so the, and the ECA has been, has been doing that. Like I've been wearing one of the ECAs, um, every single day, pretty much for the last, uh, for the last week plus, uh, at this point, since I've had Ricardo's, um, in that he's loaning me right now. So like I said, very impressed so far. Um, I don't know when I'm going to film the review because I might actually take my time a little bit with this one since I don't have to rush it since it doesn't have to be back to, um, like a brand in any specific time or anything like that. So we will see what happens there. Um, again, as you guys are coming into the chat, make sure you hop in there and say hello. And also if you guys have, um, discussion topics, if you guys have questions that you'd like me to answer, um, I'm more than happy to, uh, to solicit those from the chat from you. Ken says you're double wristing today, the NTH Barracuda Brown and a LACO type B. Very cool. I've looked at the um, I've looked at the Laco Type Bs before, and I've all, I've come very close to getting one. Long Island Watch used to have the uh, PBD one that had the orange numerals on it. Um, the thing that always stopped me is that it always bugs me that it has a uh, Miota Eight Series movement inside of it, so that it can't uh, so that it can't hack or hand wind. Or I, it might be able to hand wind, but I know it can't. I know it can't hack for sure. So I'm also going over to Instagram real quick. I'm seeing uh, if there's any questions in there. I know questions in there. Just someone saying hello. So that means it's on you guys today. It's on the chat to kind of provide us with the additional talking topics, the additional talking points as we go uh, through the live stream here today. Uh, the first one that we can talk about that I've been thinking about for the last uh, the last week or so. So in the last episode of Bearded Time, um, Ricardo kind of challenged himself that by the end of the year, by the end of 2020, he wants to be down to a five watch collection. Now he only has six watches right now. So getting down to five um, would not be that difficult, but he's also factoring in watches that he's going to acquire throughout 2020 as well. And I don't know how many watches he has his eye on or how many watches he's seriously considering right now. And he challenged me to get down to 10. So currently my watch collection sits at 11. Um, it's 13 if you count the digital watches, which I don't necessarily because um, I don't wear. I have I have the Casio Royale, um, the Casio World Timer, and I have a Timex Iron Man. Don't, those don't get worn on any kind of regular basis. Um, but I have 11 mechanical watches uh, that I have, and I know that there's a couple watches that I'm going to pick up throughout the year. And he's like, ah, I challenge you to get down to 10. Ricardo says, hey, in the chat, he's wearing his time XQ today. What's up, Ricardo? I've got your watch uh, still held hostage so far today. So <laughs> that's that's what I'm rocking on the wrist right now. But Ricardo's like, oh, like, I, you know, I'm challenging you to get down to 10 watches. And I was like, whatever. Like, <laughs> like I'm, I'm not a big guy. I'm not a big guy when it comes to like, oh, I've got to have a certain number of watches in my collection. I've got to get down um, to a certain number. And so, uh, so, I, so I was like, whatever. 
And then I started thinking about it after the stream was over. And I was like, huh, is there any watches that I would like to keep that I really don't need in the collection? And so now I'm actually thinking about, like, can I get under 10 watches this year, including any purchases that I might make as the year goes along? And it's, it's, I, I, I'm, I wonder why we do that, honestly. Like, I really wonder why we kind of set these arbitrary, um, goals on our collection. I know for me personally, I like to have a collection that all the watches in the collection are going to be worn on a regular basis. So I, I, I know for me, that's kind of my motivation for not letting my, not letting my personal collection sprawl too far out of control is that I don't want watches that are just going to sit inside of a watch box for six months and then I might wear it one day. And then it's going to sit inside the watch box again for six months. Like I'd rather have stuff that is in regular rotation in my collection. And then for me, it's also kind of trying to figure out which watches are just feeling stale and which watches I actually don't want anymore. So a great example of this is my Monta Sky Quest, which is not a watch that I'm going to get rid of. But the Sky Quest kind of feels stale right now because I've had it for almost a year. Um... And, and I think what I need to do for that is I just need to buy like a new strap for it. I need to buy a new leather strap to pair with it to just kind of freshen up the look because it only has so many different, you know, strap options that I can use with it. So I think maybe getting a new strap will kind of make that watch, you know, feel new again, if that makes sense, or just feel more fresh than it feels in my collection. Uh, but Ricardo, you bastard, like I'm, I'm now thinking about like watches that I know I don't want to necessarily get rid of, but I'm just like, do I need to have this watch? Uh, in my collection because we talked about it on the podcast. So uh, Ken asked, did you give up on the Grand Seiko or just poor impulse control buying the Calypso? Uh, it is definitely the latter of the two options. I still definitely want to get the Grand Seiko at some point, the 9F Quartz at some point. Um, it was just it was just impossible to, to pass this up because, like I said, I had been looking for this particular variant of the Calypso for quite some time. No, I'm good. Um, I've been looking for this particular variant of the Calypso for quite some time. I always said to myself that if I could get it at an affordable price point, um, that I would that I would do it. And like I said, it came out, you know, on Facebook from the guy that I bought it from at a price that I was happy to happy to pay for it. Now, now poor impulse control would be getting the brew master graph that I'm seriously considering right now. That would be the poorest of impulse controls. Um, if I decided to do that, because that's that's weighing very heavily on my mind, I might I might reach out to Jonathan and see if I could actually just get one in for review, and hopefully that'll satiate my uh, my desire for that watch. Um, that would be super poor impulse control. But no, the Calypso is one that, like I said, I, I I said that if I was going to, I said that I wanted to get it, and so once the opportunity came along, it was kind of a thing of I either get it now. Or I'm probably never going to get it. Like, if I don't get it at this price, I'm probably never going to own this watch. And so I did it. Um, and so far, like I said, it's been enjoyable so far. And what's cool about this one, so I talked in the unboxing video about the fact that it's, uh, obviously it has these, you know, 12 millimeter lugs on there because the lugs are, you know, very broadsided. Um, and so I'm going to probably try one of my first, like, watch... Uh, arts and crafts projects, I guess you could say, because I'm going to see if I'm able to make new straps for this. Not necessarily make new straps, but I'm going to see if I'm able to modify a leather strap uh, to be able to fit on this watch. So I'm going to take one of my cheap leather straps. My wife offered uh, the crappy leather strap that came with her Dan Henry 1939 um, for me to use as a as a prototype, basically. And I'm going to try. I'm going to cut that strap. And I'm going to see if I can do it so that it's able to be used on um, on this watch. So we're going to try that. Uh, if that's the case, then uh, then I might get another leather strap or two to uh, to use with this thing long term. Because like I said, I like the cro the crocodile strap that this comes with, but this is not really my preferred uh, type of leather strap. And it kind of matches the watch but it also makes it feel way too fancy like way fancier than this watch uh probably deserves so we're like so we're gonna give that a shot here in the couple in a matter of weeks um i may film that i may be brave enough to film me uh you know str you know 
fumbling and struggling my way through that project. We'll see. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see there, but no, the Grand Seiko is still very much in my plans. Um, just might be in the longer down the road plans. That's another reason too, that I was thinking about selling some stuff is so I can raise some funds to get that though. That much quicker. Uh, Flip and Zippo is in the chat. How's it going today? And guys, again, if you're in the chat, say hello. Um, I've only seen a couple of you so far. Let me know what you're rocking on your wrist today. It would help if I don't have the watch behind the microphone, typically. And if you guys uh, have any questions for me, if there's any discussion topics that you wanted to talk about, uh, let me know in the chat as well. And, uh, and we can talk about it here during this stream. Um, I know one of the other things that I want to talk about is the Rolex, um, the Rolex price increases. So if you guys didn't see, uh, Rolex has increased prices on the majority of their like steel sports watches pretty much across the board. <clears throat> I think the, uh, the, the amount of percentage, the prices have gone up ha is varied from model to model. Um, I think the average, I think across the board is 7% increase. And some people are kind of freaking out about it. Some people are upset about it. Some people are like, oh yeah, you know, you know, we saw this coming and I'm really thinking about it in kind of in my context, um, you know, for me as a watch buyer and, and a watch buyer specifically who doesn't, uh, doesn't really have Rolex money. Like, like I don't, I'd have to save up for a pretty considerable amount of time to get pretty much any Rolex that, uh, that exists out there on the market just because my disposable income is not that vast that I can just drop, you know, five, six, seven grand on a watch. And so like, I understand why Rolex did this. Um, it's kind of hard to see your watches sell on a secondary market for an insane markup and not, you know, not react to that as a company. Cause if someone else is selling, you know, your $9,000 watch, on a secondary market for $12,000, you know, that it's, it would be irresponsible for you as a business to not bring your prices up to kind of, to close that gap a little bit. Now they might be chasing it into oblivion because then if they raise the price to $11,000 and the secondhand, you know, store still selling it for $13,000, then you're just going to have this cycle that, you know, they're going to be constantly chasing that secondary market. Um, so again, I get, I get why Rolex <clears throat> decides to increase the prices. However, I think that it takes what that does though is it takes enthusiasts that are kind of in you know in the the purview of like like me and and like Ricardo who you know we have disposable money for watches but not necessarily Rolexes and it really does force us to kind of confront the fact that Rolex might be one of those brands that might be pacing themselves outside of where we're able to attain. And so rather as looking at like a Rolex Explorer you guys know is my kind of like my ultimate grail right now. That's kind of the watch that long, 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 long term that I'd like to pick up. But that might be going to a point that might be going to a, a, a cost that I'm not willing to pay um, for that watch. And so, like I said, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's kind of something I'm thinking about. Um, oh, good. I'm getting a phone call while we're on this. Yeah, we don't want to do that. So, <laughs> so like I said, I've, I've kind of made my peace with the fact that Rolex might be a brand that's not even an aspirational brand for me at this point. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of making peace with the fact that Rolex is kind of joining, you know, those, those not Hoderology brand because Rolex is not that, but I'm just kind of, you know, coming to grips with the fact that I'm probably not going to own a Rolex, at least not for a very long time. Like if you guys make me hyper successful and I'm making like TGV money, then maybe I'll get a Rolex at some point. But chances are um, it's not a brand that I that's reasonably, you know, something that I can aspire to at this point. And I think also that Tudor basically is that now. Like Tudor essentially has become what Rolex was like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, essentially just in terms of, you know, being able to acquire it, the quality. And I would imagine that the Tudor quality is still not up to the level of where Rolex is just because, um, you know, it's, it, there's still going to be a separation between the two. But I think that for, for those of us who, you know, for us, a 
pricey watch purchase is going to be, you know, that three, four, five thousand dollar watch. I think Tudor is it. Um, and I'm and I'm okay with that. I'm totally okay with that. I generally find Tudor's designs more interesting than Rolexes anyway. Like Rolexes are classic and they're kind of very iconic. Tudor's having more fun though. Like to, like Tudor's is getting, you know, they're they're going a little bit out more outside of the box. Um when it comes to, you know, different designs and things of that nature as well. Um, Flippin' Zip says, what about an older older birth year Rolex? The problem is all the stuff that I would want. Like, I'm not a date just guy. I'm not a, I'm not a Rolex day date guy. I'm not a, uh, like, like I like their, you know, I'm, I'm more of like a, maybe an Oyster Perpetual. That might be in the wheelhouse. Um, you know, but I'm more of an Explorer guy. Um, never really thought about like a birth year Rolex. Birth year watch in general never really uh something that i've worried about so 84 is my birth year and um i don't know like it's like a birth year watch is just something that's never really crossed my mind too much partially because i'm still kind of terrified to buy vintage like i still haven't got the uh i still haven't got the um <laughs> the, the the courage to venture into vintage watch realm which is funny because i just went to a red bar meetup uh, a week ago here in Baltimore and most of the red bar group is uh most of the red bar group is uh they're, they're vintage guys like most of the people that are in that chapter collect a ton of vintage watches like they have uh, several vintage Rolexes vintage Tudors vintage Seikos um other stuff beyond that they love collecting vintage and for me like I am still super terrified to kind of wade into that end of the pool because I know enough to know that I don't know enough um, to make a safe vintage purchase. Um, yeah, what, Ricardo says Tudor, definitely. He still wants the Polar Oyster Perpetual. Yeah, that's definitely nice. Um, sorry, I'm uh, I am just looking at my... Oh, okay. Sorry. I, the, the phone call that I got was from my work. Um, and apparently uh, my old work did not open their store on time today. So that's unfortunate for them. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Gitmo Holiday says, uh, good day from the Netherlands. What is up? Uh, again, let me know what you guys are rocking on your wrist today. So I know what uh, I know what Ken Spears wearing. I know what Ricardo is wearing. Let me know what your guys' wristwatch checks are. Uh, Flippin' Zippo says, the Oyster Quartz is going to explode in collectability. I'm actually surprised that that hasn't happened yet um, with Rolex. And, and I kind of expected because... As a lot of really popular channels, um, we're talking about Seiko 9F courts, especially Grand Seiko 9F courts, especially. I'm surprised that more folks didn't uh, didn't shift over to that Oyster Quartz realm because um, apparently those are still pretty attainable. Uh, I would not mind at all having having a Rolex uh, Oyster Quartz. Again, the, the thing about the Quartz movements is just that I, I don't want just the bog standard one. I want, you know, the cool ones. And I know the Oyster Quartz has, like, the temperature regulation. Um, you know, definitely one of the better Quartz movements uh, that is out there. So definitely a solid uh, a solid pickup for sure. Uh, Gimmo Holiday says he's, he's sporting a Certina Vintage DS2 from 1968. See, very cool. Great example of a watch that I'd be way too afraid of. Uh, to purchase. Maybe that's that's something I should do at some point. I, I might do a video at some point about how buying a vintage watch, the prospect of buying a vintage watch is really terrifying because I keep looking at all sorts of like Seiko chronographs, um, like, you know, 60, what is it, the 6109s or 613. I can't remember which series, but like Seiko chronographs from like the 70s and early 80s. And there's a lot of them out there that I really like. But I'm just, again, I'm too afraid to buy them just because I don't want to wear, um, you know, buy something that's going to be, that's going to be crap. So Michael says wearing the uh, Tudor Black Bay Black on bracelet. Very cool. Uh, Flip and Zippo says 90 Speedmaster automatic with a blue dial. I haven't seen too many blue dial Speedmasters um, over the years. And then uh, Gibbon says his 13 is on the vintage bracelet. Oh, we could talk about that real quick pretty sure that uh that rick and i are going to talk about it on whatever the next episode of beard of time is um gotta love omega man so like i said uh, I, I don't know if you guys saw so last year of course they announced that they were doing 
the uh, the reissue of the Omega the three two one Speedmaster movement. Um, but they decided to do it in platinum, which of course priced it to like an obscene amount of money, like over fifty thousand dollars. And so everyone hemmed and hawed, and they said, "Oh man, if only you guys would do the three two one Speedmaster in stainless steel, that would be great." And you should have known that they were going to do it, <laughs> and because of course they were. What we did not realize is that they were going to charge thirteen thousand dollars for uh, for the, the you know the three two one Speedmaster in stainless steel, which is which is such an Omega move. Um, if you're really like desiring that movement, I don't think that's going to be a restrictive price for you. Like if you're someone that has that money, that's like I really want a three two one Speedmaster, you'll pay thirteen grand. But what a just what a dick baller move <laughs> by Omega to charge that price point um, for that watch. Because correct me if I'm wrong, most limited edition Speedmasters usually come in around like what seven or eight thousand dollars. And now I get you know making a limited edition movement is probably a bit more costly than making a limited edition dial and bezel combination. But man, I wonder how many people out there were kind of ticked off uh, once they saw that uh, that three two one Speedmaster price point for the uh, for the stainless steel model. The bracelet's really nice, though. I know in our uh, in in a little you know watch reviewer chat that I'm in on Instagram, uh, we remarked on the bracelet more than we did for the watch. But uh, <laughs> like I said I, I always laugh when I see those special editions. Yeah, Flip and Zimbo says that you know they're they're marking as all quote hand assembled. Hand assembled, sure, of course they are, but hand manufactured, unlikely, not at that price point, not from Omega. So yeah, Omega Omega stays stays strong with their uh with their insanely priced limited edition watches. I still can't believe that 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 James, the new James Bond watch, like the Spectre one. That's the Speedmaster with the with the Fotina all over it that that I've talked about on Bearded Time with Ricardo. I still can't believe those are eight thousand dollars, and I still can't believe that people are going to happily um, happily pay that price point. So Ricardo says he did some research, and he says the price was somewhat warranted. So I'm going to count on him to expound a bit on that in chat real quick. And I will uh, I will read that to you guys uh, as he does, but just the broad strokes because, like I said, I'm pretty sure that we're going to talk about that watch uh, on Bearded Time next episode. But Ricardo's been uh, Ricardo's been going to those horology society meetings in New York, so he's he's been he's been learning some stuff, um, which is very cool as well. That's that's one thing that uh, you definitely definitely need advantage of living in a city like New York over living in a city like Baltimore. Like we don't have a hor- you know horological society of Baltimore. Uh, that has cool meetings that we can go to, but you are definitely bound to find something like that over in New York for sure. So again, guys, if you have any questions, uh, if you have any discussion topics, let me know down there in the chat and we can, uh, we can talk about that stuff real quick because as far as, uh, as far as stuff that I came equipped with today, uh, that was pretty much it. Uh, I can tell you guys that as far as uh, watches that are catching my eye, so of course, notice dropped the sector watches recently. Um, really like those uh, quite a bit, I actually. So I've I had seen both in person a couple months ago, I'd, or prototypes of them at least. And the field watch spoke to me much more than the sector diver did. But upon kind of further review, and once I've seen the full the full lineup, the full scope of them. Um, the sector diver is actually, I think the way to go when it comes to, when it comes to those notice watches, uh, those are very cool. So those are ones that, uh, that are definitely tempting the wallet a little bit. John appears in the chat. What's up, man? Good morning. How are you? Uh, let me know what you're, what you're rocking on your wrist today. I'm curious to see. I'm, I'm going to predict Torsk diver. That's what I'm going to predict. Uh, you're wearing on your wrist today. So you can prove me wrong. Um, and then John asked, what other micro brands would you like to review? Um, that is a long and exhaustive list. 
Uh, so let's see, couple couple that are on my mind right now. And you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the phone out. We're gonna we're gonna flip through Instagram real quick, and we're gonna see, um, we're gonna see if there's any watch mic break uh, watch micro brands on there that I'm really anxious to review right now. So let's flip through the list. I will tell you that one of them is definitely Traska. So Traska just released their new free diver. Um, they just released their their new field watch, the Summiteer. Both watches are excellent. Um, I've seen them in person, gotten to handle them in person. I would absolutely love to review either one of those uh, from Trask because that's a really impressive watch that they have going on. Um, I talked about the Brew uh, Master Graph that just came out. Uh, that watch looks incredible. Um, I'm really coming close to thinking about buying one. I'm really trying not to because, again, I'm trying to hang on to the watch fund. I'm not trying to blow that money, um, but I would absolutely love to see what those guys have going on as well. Um, trying to think of what other like micro brands. I, the, the Cincinnati watch company pilots watch that's going around um, with a couple of reviewers looks interesting at first glance. It wasn't something that I found particularly impressive. Um, but as I keep seeing it, because I have friends that either have it in for review um, and have been checking it out that I've been seeing constant pictures of it. That, that watch is starting to grow on me a little bit more. So that one's really cool. Those are probably like the top three, just in terms of micro brands, um, that I'd like to check out at some point. Uh, Pelton is also on that list, but I, I can't, I don't think I can review Pelton. I don't think that they send out review samples to, uh, especially I guess to like lower channels because all their stuff is made to order um and 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 hand put together and all that jazz um but yeah so those are kind of the those are kind of the big three i guess right now is those three brands as far as the micro brands go um gitmo says he thinks rolex is pushing other brands to become better even the lower tier brands that's an interesting thought um i think that lower tier brands and other brands are gonna be better anyway just because we're in one of the best ages I think that you can be in for watches. Just if you look at the whole scope of history, um, because never before, or maybe not since, you know, the pre courts crisis, have you had, <clears throat> pardon me. Have you had so many like smaller watch brands putting out really solid watch products? Like the rise of the micro brands for me is an incredibly exciting movement inside the watch industry because it's broadening choice and it's making watches attainable um, that might not normally be attainable if they were being made and marketed and, and manufactured by the traditional brands out there. Um, obviously, you know, movement sourcing and stuff like that makes that sort of things possible. Um, improvements in, you know, CNC manufacturing and the price of that comes down um, overseas is making that possible. So I don't know if it's Rolex per se. I do think that what you're seeing from Rolex kind of being pushed up the the price structure is a bit of a response to that in some ways. Um, and I think that they are continuing to improve on their quality and they're continuing to make their watches the best they can be. But I really think it's the secondary market that's that's impacting Rolex more than Rolex is necessarily... Uh, motivating other brands to move up. I think in, I think Tudor, you could make that argument. I think that what Tudor is doing, making the watch that they're making in that price range, which, I mean, I guess you can, you can give credit to Rolex for, they are the parent company. Um, I think that that is certainly incur, you know, forcing people to kind of step their game up a little bit as well. Um, but yes, yeah, so that is uh that, that's an interesting thought process though. Uh, Ricardo says, as far as like micro brands to try out, uh, Weiss would be another one of those brands. I've looked at their watches before. Um, they don't really have any designs that speak to me that I've seen at least so far. I get a Shinola vibe from Weiss and that's not fair. And that's not a nice thing to say, because I know that Weiss's watches are, are probably of a little bit better quality than Shinola's are speaking of which, by the way, so I went to, I went to the local AD the other day. I was super surprised to see that they actually had, and it was right next to 
right next to the Blanc Pond case, actually. So they, they, these guys were a Blanc Pond authorized dealer, and in the case next to the Blanc Pond case, they had a whole Shinola layout. And I was like, I didn't know that Shinola was in a was a brand that was inside of you know ADs and stuff like that. But apparently they are. So uh, yeah, so that was a little bit a little bit weird. Definitely not buying one of those uh, at any time ever. I don't think. Uh, Flip News says Rolex trying to stay ahead of the curve. Maybe my my only worry with that is that it becomes a race to the sky at that point. Like if, if you know, if, if the secondary market for Rolex sports watches doesn't, doesn't level out at all, um, then you have this race into oblivion. And I, I there's going to come a point where that bubble bursts, right? Like there is a price that is a maximum price that someone is willing to pay for a Rolex sports watch, right? Like you can't, you can't sit there and, and, you know, charge 15 grand for a Submariner. No one like there, there does come a point where people are like, I'm not paying that price point. So the bubble does have to burst at some point. I know it's like super cliche to say that now, but it's true. Like, like at some point there does have to be an end to that. It's just curious to see uh, where that's going to be. Uh, John says that there's a couple stores in DC that has Shinola as well. Yeah. It just feels like they don't quite belong there. You know what I mean? And maybe that's me. Maybe that's me projecting my thoughts on Shinola onto that situation. That might be the case, but I don't know. They, it just doesn't feel like they're, 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 uh, you know, standing alongside those brands, I guess you can say. Uh, Ricardo says thoughts on the recent failed new micro brands. Um, look, man, it's a competitive, it's a competitive market out there right now for micro brands. So part of the, part of the, you know, the explosion of micro brands also means that now we're going to start to get those quality tiers between the different micro brands. So like, just like you do within the Swiss industry, you know, where you have, you know, you know, you have your Rolexes on one tier and then in the next tier you have Tudor and Omega's probably on in that tier with Tudor right now. Maybe that's not being fair. And I should, you know, there, I think maybe they sit in between Rolex and Omega. I don't know, but like you have these different tiers of, of quality. And so that's going to, if you're a new micro brand company that's coming into the marketplace, it's going to force you to kind of choose where you want your watches to be. And the problem is that if you are going to try to get into that, you know, five, $600 micro brand realm, as opposed to like that three, $400 micro brand realm, it's going to require you to be on point as far as designing your watch as far as getting your project set up as far as marketing effectively um not wasting money not wasting time and this is why i think it's a really good thing uh that like chris vale and john keel and and those guys have started doing microbrand university because the, this is a it, it's a situation where you definitely want advice from people who have been successful and have kind of made, have kind of failed. They can show you like the, you know, the pitfalls. They can show you what to avoid, and that I think gives you a better chance of succeeding. And you know, I've I've seen a couple of watch brands myself, micro brands that have not been successful. Um, I know that uh, Lucas, which I with with I think from Atria, if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember the uh, the the brand name. I uh, had a sports watch that a lot of people liked, but couldn't get the project together. Uh, the Merlin sea legend that I reviewed, uh, I think that was a more of an issue with not having a very cohesive Kickstarter campaign behind their watch. Um, that caused that project to fail. Um, you have the, uh, I, was it a Cura? I can't remember. Um, I know that, uh, uh, Mike Scott watches from, uh, from the time bum and, and relative time, um, had a, had a watch that, uh, that they really like that they have they bought the prototypes for uh from a guy that whose project was on track to be successful and he had to cancel it um halfway through just because there was going to be issues with the project itself that would cause him not to be able to fulfill uh the watches so you just if you're starting a micro brand now you really have to be um on point at all aspects and so i would definitely recommend like reaching out to other people in the micro brand watch industry that have been successful because uh, those guys are willing to share their knowledge. They're happy to, to lend advice and pay that forward. Uh, weirdly, even though there, it's a competitive space, 
uh, it's a very uh, community driven space as well. I've seen with all the different, you know, brand manufacturers and things like that out there. Um, but yeah, man, like I said, it's, it, it's, it's tough because there is only so much market that you have there because while the micro brand watch industry is growing, the customer base for those watches is not growing at the same rate that the that the available options are so inevitably when you have that you know that confluence events where the customer base is not growing that much but the amount of options that are out there is growing that much you're going to have a lot of brands that you know may have been successful five years ago uh, that aren't going to see the same level of success uh today for sure um so guys like i said real quick if there's anything else you want to talk about get it in the chat um because we're probably going to wrap it up soon getting back to um other other watches that have really caught my eye. So I just got the email from Collins Watch that they are taking orders and they're shipping soon their new Sonar uh, dive watch from the Collins Watch company. I'm going to tell you guys uh, if you're looking if you've been like looking for a new watch to get and you like divers but you want something that is a little off the beaten path but not like insanely off the beaten path, go check out the Collins Sonar. Um, there are few dive watches uh, that I've been more impressed with than that watch uh, when I got to check it out a few months back over at District Time. Really attractive watch. Um, the initial price point they're selling it at is a very good price point considering what you're getting for that watch, um, the movement that's inside of it, the level of finishing on the watch. Um, it's, it's just an excellent freaking watch uh, that you guys should definitely check out um at some point so i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna pimp that one up a little bit and uh, and say to check out the collins sonar uh dive watch for sure which i think just went on sale uh this week if i'm not mistaken so gitmo asks what about the negative influence of amazon politics on the success of some brands so you're gonna have to expound on that a little bit because i'm not really sure um what you are referencing, unless you're just talking about the fact that Amazon will tend to, you know, watches that Amazon sells or watches that are sold um, through Amazon, where Amazon's getting, you know, a percentage of the sale and Amazon's willingness to kind of float those watches up to the top of the search feed. If that's what you're referring to, um, I don't truly know how big of an impact that that would have on the success or failure of some brands it's and especially like it depends on what brands you're talking about like if we're talking about like like your like your swatch group brands i'm sure that they are helped by that a fair amount but also remember too that amazon in most cases um if you're buying a watch or like so he, he said amazon is pressing pressing some brands to lower their margins well Correct me if I'm wrong, though. So Amazon, I don't know. Is Amazon an authorized seller for a lot of a lot of brands out there? Because any time that I've seen like Swatch, you know, Swatch brand watches on Amazon, they're being sold mostly at like gray market prices, which means that Amazon at that point would not be an authorized dealer of those watches. So I think that that's more of a more of a gray market um, kind of deal. Or at least a lot of gray market watches around Amazon. I know that when I bought my Hamilton, um, you know, a couple of years ago at this point, I did buy that from Amazon and I thought it was from an authorized dealer because they purported themselves as being an authorized dealer. This is back when I didn't know jack shit <laughs> back in the day. And, uh, and that was, and I come to find out that that was definitely a gray market dealer that was selling it through Amazon as well. Um, I don't know how much sway Amazon truly would have on the watch industry. I think that that's one market that Amazon's hand doesn't isn't quite as heavy um, as you would find in other aspects of retail, partially because I feel like if you are uh, if you are buying those kind of watches, you have a generally greater knowledge base. And you might not, you know, go through Amazon um, directly. You might go to, you know, to an authorized dealer or to other gray markets directly. 
uh, instead through Amazon. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure Amazon still sells a hell of a lot of watches, but they probably sell more Invictas than anything else, if I if I was just guessing. Um, and Jama asks, what is the longest owned watch still in my collection? Well, that would easily be um, the Sal Baltimore Founders Edition, the OG uh, in my collection would be the longest owned watch that I've had because that was the first mechanical watch uh, that I ever owned and it still gets regular wear. That's a watch that even as I talk about looking at watches that I might possibly sell down the road, uh, that's one that I will never, ever, ever sell is that Sal Baltimore Collector's Edition it, or Founder's Edition. It has It has way too much sentimental value for me to sell it. And even though I don't wear it regularly like i probably wear that watch once or twice a month at most but because it got me into this hobby and because the retail value wouldn't be that high on it but mostly because it got me into this hobby um it's not a watch that i would ever consider parting ways with plus it works really well with a variety of stuff like it's a very you know neutral black dialed pilot style layout so it works great in a variety of situations. The only thing that kind of stops it from, you know, working everywhere is just the size of the watch. Um, but that's that will always be the longest owned watch in my collection um, that gets regular wear. Second longest would be the Hamilton, uh, the the day date Hamilton that I have, uh, which I also might not ever really consider getting rid of. I thought about getting rid of that watch before and then I wear it for like, you know, three days in a row. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. That's why I don't, that's why I'm not getting rid of this watch because it's all, it's amazing because it's awesome. Uh, Paul asks what micro brands failed. There, there's a few, um, it, I wouldn't even say necessarily failed. Like it's not like there's a lot of established micro brands that have gone away. Um, there are a lot of micro brands that couldn't get up off the ground um, all the way. So like I said, I mentioned, I mentioned Merlin, comes to mind. Uh, Akura is one that comes to mind as well, who had a six, uh, uh, Kickstarter project that was destined to be successful. Like I think they were on track to meet their funding goal and the guy had to pull, uh, pull the project because he wasn't going to be able to, something happened on, on the manufacturing end that he wasn't going to be able to uh, fulfill that. And then like, I know um, uh, Lucas, and I, I can't remember his brands because I, I know they started as Miris, um, and I think it, it changed to like, like a Tika or something like that. Can't remember what the brand was. I know it started with an A, but they had a sports watch uh, that was coming as well that a lot of folks were really excited about. But again, through for manufacturing reasons. And by the way, too, that's that's another reason why too. As you know, more micro brands are kind of entering the marketplace. There's only so many people. There's only so many places over in China that do that manufacturing. And those factories have schedules. Those factories have, um, you know, th they have work orders that they have to get out. So it's it might be a case where you're trying to launch a watch. It might be months before your project is actually going to be completed by these by these factories. And so that requires a ton of long term planning. Like it's for for the watch industry. Like waiting on Kickstarter sucks in general. I did a whole video about it. But can you imagine like getting your Kickstarter money and being like, yeah, we're not gonna be able to fulfill for like eight months. That's gonna be that's gonna make it very difficult for you to attract backers uh, to your projects. So that's just something to something to think about too in the micro brand space. Uh, Flim's the best. Are there any micro brands that are not Chinese? Well, most micro brands, because of the costs involved, are going to at least have parts, at least have their stuff manufactured in China. Some micro brands also do assembly in China as well. Um, some micro brands don't like notice, for example, they get all of their parts ordered and then they do the assembly um, in the U S but most micro brands. And, and I'm, and I mean like the vast majority of micro brands do definitely um, get all of their work done in China and then gets the product shipped over here. There are definitely a handful that aren't. Um, there are a few Swiss micro brands out there. Those tend to be of like the haute horology, like, hey, this is a $60,000 watch and we only make 20 of these a year kind of micro brands. Like, so those are definitely not Chinese manufactured for sure. 
Um, I know Pelton, for example, is one who is not manufactured in China. Um, they do all their stuff by hand uh, here in the U.S., but their their watch is also much more expensive. Um, I don't know about like a Manta, for example. So like Manta, I would imagine that some of their parts are manufactured in China, but I know that their watches are assembled uh, in Switzerland. So, I would, so again, there's probably some Chinese parts in there, um, but their stuff is their stuff is manufactured in in Switzerland, or assembled in Switzerland, and I think partially manufactured in Switzerland as well. If Lipman says anything made of Chinese and puts me off, don't be like that though, because that's that's the thing though is that every almost every watch brand on the planet that's an affordable watch, with the exception of like your Seikos and your Japanese brands, because those are going to be located mainly in Japan. Almost every watch that you buy is going to have some level of Chinese manufacturing in it, just because the that's that's where manufacturing is happening. Like if you want to, if you want to keep costs down, it's, it's kind of unavoidable, you know what I mean? But just like, I, I know that the Chinese manufacturing gets a, gets a bad knock and in the watch industry, it continues to get a bad knock as well, but talk to, talk to watch brand makers, talk to, talk to people who deal with these Chinese factories, because just like anything else in the world. There are Chinese, you know, manufacturing plants that are doing really good work, and there are Chinese manufacturing plants that are doing really crappy work. And so, yeah, so that I mean, it's so just because a wa watch is partially manufactured in China or has some Chinese parts in it doesn't mean that it's a bad watch. Um, and as Ricardo points out, even the Swiss brands do it as well. Absolutely, like even your Rolexes and Omegas even though all of their stuff is assembled in house, they're not necessarily making all of the parts in house. A lot of their parts are coming uh, from Chinese manufacturing plants that they're just assembling. So again, every watch that you, almost every watch that you buy is going to have some level of Chinese manufacturing in it. It's just a matter of whether or not it's, it's good quality and the brands that are good quality tend to have better manufacturers and the brands that are crappy quality tend to have worse manufacturers. Um, let's see. Eli says, speaking of Chinese, do you think the more expensive micro brands will be able to survive in the future when low cost brands like San Martin are just doing more and more? I, I think they will be able to survive. So like NTH, for example, I don't think is going to have a problem uh, with staying power. I don't think NTH is going anywhere as far as like a micro brand. And we'll use them as an example because you brought them up as an example. What I think is going to be difficult is I think it's going to be difficult for new brands to, you know, get into the micro brand industry at that price point. So like at this point in time, like if you, if you take an NTH sub, right, they cost $650. I think most of us out there um, are, are comfortable paying $650 for an NTH sub because NTH is a proven brand name at this point. Um, we know what we're getting when you buy an NTH sub, but if, you know, someone else comes along and says, Hey, here's, here's my dive watch. It's just as good as an NTH. It's got a Miyota 9015 inside of it. Uh, it's great, but you know, we're some random brand and we're also going to charge $650 for that dive watch. You might have some skepticism You might because you're not an established brand. We don't know, what you're getting from you. So we're not going to be necessarily comfortable paying that price point for your watch. And, you know, that's something that Chris had to earn over, over that, you know, that reputation is something that Chris had to earn uh, first through Lou and Huey and then, and then through NTH. Uh, but because he's earned that he's allowed to deal with that price point, but new brands are always going to have to come in uh, at a lower price point until they kind of establish that, that brand cachet, that kind of, that kind of brand, recognition um notice was the same way like notices original the first watches were you know more of the entry level price point and then they came out with the avalon but by the time that they dropped the avalon which was a more premium watch that they had come out with and that was at a little bit of a higher price point they already had that uh they already had that brand recognition so people were more willing to pay that price point because they had seen what had come before and, he, and and Eli says he wouldn't want to start a new micro brand now. So much competition 
and movement price hikes. Yeah, it's it's a tough time, man, to get into the microbrand space now. I think that we point where we have a really good stable of microbrands out there. There's a ton of variety. Uh, there's a ton of different brands at different price points to to satiate different needs that are doing really good work. Um, but it is a very difficult industry to break into. One of the brands that I'm looking at right now that I'm very curious to see what the long-term success is going to look like uh, is Atticus Watches. So if you guys don't know who Atticus is, um, Atticus is a new brand started by uh, Rusty, who is actually Chris's uh, Chris Vale from NTH's like Part, you know, part of his design team and the guy that does like all his 3D renders and stuff like that. And it looks like that Rusty is using the same manufacturer. Um, it looks like he's using a lot of the same, you know, a lot of the same parts and, and going for a similar style as NTH. Uh, but he's going for the, you know, like the fixed bezel kind of sports watch version of what you get from like an NTH. And it's going to be interesting to see how his brand is able to get off the ground because I don't know if a lot of people are aware of kind of the NTH DNA that exists with inside Atticus. And I'm sure Chris is giving him a lot of help as well in, in getting, in getting the brand started. So I'm sure there's a lot of shared DNA between those watches, but because it doesn't have that NTH name, uh, it'll like, so it'll be curious to see how that goes. Uh, Ricardo says that he thinks it's going to get harder and harder to come in at a competitive price because the relationships needed take time. And that's another thing as well, man. Cause like, like I mentioned with, with all of the different, you know, manufacturing plants, um, they've got a lot of work that they have to do right now. So you can't just kind of walk in the door, kick in the door and be like, yeah, you got to make my stuff right away. Cause it's gonna be great. Like now you have to work with those people. Um, you have to, you have to build that relationship. Talk to, again, talk to the most successful micro brands out there. And they will all tell you that the relationship that's developed between them and their manufacturers is one that's been done at, you know, at over years. And, and Ricardo also says, Chris can yell at manufacturing to get things done while new companies might get the, you know, Oh, you know, I, I know we told you three months originally, but it's actually going to take you six months. And look, even Chris runs into problems too. Like Chris, you know, has a very good relationship with his people, but even he had, he runs into issues as well. Um, but listen to him tell the story about how he was able to get the NTH cases uh, machined to such a thin level. And listen to him, like his manufacturer, be like, "Yeah, we're never doing this for anybody ever again because this was such a pain in the ass." Um, but because Chris has that relationship, he's able to still to still get that done. So, um, guys, we are over fifty minutes, so I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you guys so much for waking up with me uh, on Sunday, uh, which uh, which is a good time for this. Actually, we might uh, I might try to do it more regularly. On Sundays, because I know on Saturday nights, when I get home from work, I'm exhausted. And so sometimes I don't feel like doing these. Uh, but Sunday mornings are usually pretty good. Got my coffee with me. Um, and like I said, we had a pretty good turnout here in the chat as well. Um, so thank you guys so much for swinging by this morning. Uh, thank you so much for being active in the chat this morning. As usual, um, don't forget that, uh, you know, we have bearded time happening pretty much every two weeks with me and Ricardo uh, over on watch with us. So you can either watch that through the watch this channel or uh, in podcast feeds around the world. If you subscribe to watch with us, so definitely check that out. If you haven't yet, if you like these live streams, I promise you, you'll enjoy beard time as well. Um, and obviously my channel here, which you guys I'm sure are subscribers on if you're sitting here in the chat. Um, yeah. Eli says this is a great time for afternoon evening in Europe. That was something that I was considering it was well, because I know that when I start these, um, at like six o'clock, seven o'clock, uh, Eastern U S time that it's kind of like 11 o'clock midnight, even later for you, those of you guys in Europe. So it kind of excludes you from being able to, uh, to be able to do this on a regular basis. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this time as a more regular, regular thing. Plus this way I'm not competing with the time teller because he does his on Saturday. If he's even still doing them, I have no idea, but he does his on Saturday. I'm going to do mine on Sunday and we'll, uh, we'll see what happens there. So again, thank you guys very much in the chat. Uh, for hanging out. If you guys are watching on YouTube later, uh, keep your eyes open for when we do these in the future so that you guys can be in the chat. You guys can hang out and also do whenever I do a live stream chat. If you go over to Instagram uh, at budding watch enthusiast, uh, I usually will solicit questions there as well. So just in case you can't be here, you can still participate, get your question read on the show or your discussion topic talked about the show and we'll talk about it. So that is it guys. Thanks again. Uh, see you all the next time.